Welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast, where we bring Sunday home. Join us as we dive deeper into First Baptist's weekly sermons, discuss practical applications, and answer your questions. Hello and welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast. I'm Jordan Upton, and with me as always is Pastor Jeff Reynolds. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jordan. I appreciate you guys letting me uh, join by way of Zoom. I'm at mom's house. Uh, many of you know that mom's got a little uh, a little mass in her brain that we're getting ready to radiate and take care of. And so um, spending some time just making sure she has what she needs. And so I appreciate you joining, allowing me to join in by way of uh, of Zoom this morning. How are you guys doing? Yeah, we're good. We're good. Yeah, praying for your mom. Um you know, it, it for me, it's been a bit of a couple uh, heavy days. It's been interesting because it's, you know, it's the uh, high holy days in Judaism. So the the Rosh Hashanah has already happened. Yom Kippur is coming up on on Saturday, um, and we're kind of here in the middle of the two of them. But it today is the calendar anniversary of the attacks in Israel. So it's October seventh. It's the day a year after you know Hamas attacked, and then Hezbollah has been launching lock, launching rockets since you know the day after that. Um, so it's just kind of heavy, you know. They've already launched rockets today uh, from the Houthis in Yemen. Um, so it's just, you know, kind of on edge, just hoping that nothing bad happens like it did last year. Um, obviously, you know, we're we're recording on October seventh. This is the Monday. Um, this will drop on Wednesday. But you know, we're just still praying for Israel. Still um, looking forward to the redemption. Looking forward to the uh, return of Messiah and the end to all these wars. Yeah, that's right. I agree. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, Jeff, you, you talked about Job on Sunday and, you know, there's this scene that happens in the heavenlies where, uh, Satan goes before God and, you know, these other angels are going before God. And in Judaism, that's thought about, that's thought as being a story set on Rosh Hashanah because Rosh Hashanah is, you know, we think about Yom Kippur or the day of atonement as being a day of judgment, but Rosh Hashanah is also a, a day of judgment in Jewish thought. Um, so it's like you have... Uh, this heavenly encounter that's like a court scene. You have the prosecuting attorney or Satan coming before, before God and saying, "Hey, you know, Job, you know, you're, you know, he's he's not all that great. You know, I bet I can prove it." And God's like, "Well, we'll we'll see about that." Um, yeah. So I thought it was cool that you talked about Job one on Sunday, and we'll we'll get to talk about that today. Yeah, this story uh, has been one that has captivated the minds of human beings for the ages. I mean, this this idea that this man lived so righteously and yet was tested and uh, it, it, that, that God allowed Satan to do these things. And, and ultimately it was for God's glory. And it was also for Job's glory, really, um, that, that we got to see his true character on display. And we got to see this, this accusatory nature of the enemy. Uh, you know, uh, Satan means adversary. And the Bible refers to him as the accuser of the brethren. And so he is here accusing Job uh, and Job hadn't done anything, you know, and, and, and God even brings Job up to Satan and Satan begins to levy his accusations. Yeah. If you, you let him suffer a little bit, he'll curse you to your face. And so um, it is a remarkable story. The whole, the whole book is just incredible. You get Job's friends who come and, um, <laughs> they are not very friendly. You know, the entire discourse is, Job, all this has gone wrong. What did you do? And, uh, and and that introduces this idea of what we would call reverse retribution theology. Uh, retribution theology is if you sin, there will be consequences. Reverse retribution theology is if you're going through difficulty, then you must have done something to cause that. And that is not true. That is not biblical. And the entire book of Job illustrates that that is not true and not biblical. Um, Job's testing was not arbitrary, but um, Job didn't do anything to earn it. And all of his friends spend many, many chapters of the book uh, trying to figure out what did you do? And you need to just admit it. You were obviously in the wrong. Otherwise, these things wouldn't be happening to you. So. Uh, just a just a profoundly captivating story, uh, but then to see you know in the end the spoiler alert if you turn to to chapter thirty eight and following you get to hear from God who answers back and reminds Job that God is God and Job is not. 
And, uh, and then Job is, of course, restored with even more than he had uh, before all the suffering began. So quite a captivating story for sure. It really is. And, you know, there are so many facets to talk about with the story of Job. We're, we're going to drill in on a couple, a couple points here. Um, but, uh, you know, a, as with a lot of the passages, we're not really going to do it justice. Listeners, if you have the opportunity to sit down and read all of Job 1, but really all, all of the book of Job, please do. And uh, let us know what your thoughts are. Uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating, impactful book. Um, so we're going to just hone in on a couple points here today, though. So on Sunday, Jeff, you talked about how owning a car puts you in the top 10% of people on earth in terms of wealth, um, which is not a statistic we really think about. You know, we, we think about wealth, we think about attaining wealth and keeping wealth and all, all these things. But, um, you know, as you were talking, I, I thought about the question, is in some ways the, the amount of wealth that Job has at the beginning, was that kind of a, a preliminary test? If you take my meaning, you know, the, the book is set and it's like the, the tests that we really read about are when God allows Satan to take away his wealth and take away his family, then take away his health. But really, could you say that, you know, the first preliminary test kind of before the story even begins is, Job, what are you going to do with all this wealth that you have? Yeah, I think that's a fair question, because if you look throughout Scripture, um, you know, Jesus himself says that it's difficult for a wealthy person to enter the, the kingdom of God. And, uh, you know, Solomon, Solomon had such abundant wealth and his heart strayed from God. And it wasn't just his wealth. It was all the women that he brought into his life. But part of the women being brought into his life was to acquire power and wealth. And so wealth in and of itself is a test for sure. Uh, there's a temptation, and it's the same temptation that I was referencing that Moses shared um, with the people of Israel before they were going to cross over the River Jordan into the Promised Land. And that is take care lest you become prideful and think, look at what I have done. And so I think it's altogether fair uh, to view Job's wealth as a preliminary test and to see that he handled it well. To see that, you know, even when his sons would throw feasts and his daughters would be invited uh, after the feast, Job would go and, and he would consecrate them just in case uh, that they had stepped outside of the boundaries of what God would want for them. And so um, I, I think that's very fair to say. And I think for all of us who live in the United States of America, who, you know, again, we may not be the wealthiest person on our block or, or in our sphere of uh friends and, 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 and acquaintances. Um, but when you look at a worldwide scale, I mean, it is just staggering how wealthy relatively we all are. And, uh, and I think that we have to be aware of the fact that that wealth can in and of itself become a snare to us uh, if we don't realize its source and its sustainer. And quite frankly, if we don't steward those resources as God would have us to steward them. So, yeah, I think it I think it could definitely be categorized as a preliminary test. And I think Job passed the test. And I think that was indica indicated by by God's even bringing him up to Satan there in the heavenly realm that uh, that Job had had been passing tests for quite some time. And uh, and so a new test would be introduced. Yeah, let's talk about those new tests. So God does allow Satan to take away his his wealth, his children, and then he allows him to take away even his health. Uh, and then he has, as you were saying, chapters upon chapters of uh, not encouraging conversations with his friends. Um, so the, the, it kind of all piles on after a while. Um, but, but in focusing on what, uh, what God allows Satan to do, um, what authority does Satan have over the world? You know, what, what is he allowed to get away with? Like what, you know, we, here we see like the fire of God coming down upon the earth, and, but then there's also just, you know, seemingly normal coincidences that happen. You know, what, what is Satan allowed to do in the world? Well, the New Testament calls him the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who is now uh, at work in the sons of disobedience. Jesus himself refers to Satan as the ruler of this world. And so there's this sense that this is the realm where, where Satan has the ability uh, to tempt and to accuse and to try and all those sorts of things. 
But it's important for us to remember that Satan is not God in reverse. In other words, it's not that God is the good deity and Satan is the evil deity and they are in this cosmic battle. No, Satan is created being. He was created as an angel. He was an angel who fell. And so he is not um, he is not a god. He's not deity. Um, he's a fallen angel. His uh, power is limited. His authority is limited. Where he is able to be is limited. So when we think about God, we think about God is omnipresent. He's everywhere always. Satan is not. Satan is bound by time and space. And so, you know, if your car didn't start this morning, it probably wasn't Satan making sure that your car wouldn't start because he's probably got bigger fish to fry. Um, now, it could have been demonic influence or it could have just been a dead battery. But, you know, Satan is not everywhere at all times, whereas God is everywhere at all times. Uh, God is omnipotent. He can do all things. Satan is not omnipotent. Satan is not all powerful. Uh, again, Satan is bound by space and time. Now I will say this, he's more powerful than human beings. And so we need to realize that. And that's why, um, the Bible tells us to stand firm in the strength of God's might, not in the strength of our own. Um, and God is omniscient. He knows all things past, present, and future. Satan is not, he is bound. And so, there's even this sense when you read the when you read the gospels where Satan is learning information. You know, he's trying to tempt Jesus, for goodness sake. So he doesn't know how the story ends. He knows that he is in a state of execution. He knows that 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 ultimately there is there is uh, bad stuff coming for him, but he still feels like he's got a shot. So he's in this constant state of rebellion. So Satan does have authority on the earth. He does have the ability to tempt. He does have the ability to accuse. Um, we call him the accuser of the brethren, but he is not God in reverse. And so we we have to realize that when the Bible says, greater is he who is in me, speaking of God through the Holy Spirit, than he who is in the world. That's the prince of the power of the air. That's the ruler of this world. That's Satan. God is far greater than Satan. And so um, what happens here in the book of Job, and, and this is a large portion of where we get this doctrine within our theological studies, is that God has to allow Satan to do what Satan does. So that's where we get into a discussion of the asymmetric divine agency with regard to good and evil meaning that God's relationship with the good is that good emanates from his very character. James would say every good and perfect gift is from above. And so all good things come out of the very character of God, who is the perfect good. Um, God is in control of evil such that God has to permit what he would otherwise prevent if that makes sense. And so if you notice in the book of Job, God has to allow Satan the degrees of testing, trying, and suffering that he introduces to Job's life. And so I think that's deeply instructive. So it's not that God causes us to suffer necessarily, but that it is that, that God allows things to happen and God is not without purpose in allowing those things to happen, if that makes sense. And so it's not that God is zapping us, but God has to allow those things to happen. And then what we learn is as they happen, he is with us. He is growing us. They're not arbitrary. They're not just, you know, they're not a kid with a magnifying glass focusing the sun's beam on an ant. That's not it. Um, God doesn't waste anything. And so if God allows it to happen, then God is going to use it for his glory and our good. That's hard to see in the moment. But when we look back with the 2020 vision of the clarity of being able to look back, um, we can usually begin to see, oh, wow, God, you didn't waste this. God, you used this. God, you grew me through this. God, you blessed me through this. God, you know. And, and I firmly believe, Jordan, that there will be a day in glory when we look back over the landscape of our entire lives and, and even the hardest parts of our lives. And we see 
what God was doing in the background that we couldn't possibly be aware of in the moment. And I think that there will be a great moment of gratitude for God's goodness, even through the most difficult moments of our lives. Yeah, I think it's interesting that Job, uh, some people think that Job is one of the earliest books written in, that we have in the biblical canon, uh, which means that people were struggling with why people suffer, you know, from the very beginning, because, you know, Adam and Eve suffered and, you know, it's it's a, a struggle. Like, why, you know, why do these things happen? What are the consequences of sin? To what level am I accountable for these things? Um, you know, it reminds me of a quote from, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, and I, I I don't have the quote, so I can't quote it all offhand. But essentially, he says something like, "You know, if you if you just ask simple questions and you expect there to be simple theological answers to these things, you're going to be disappointed because you're only going to get really simplistic answers that are not satisfying. You know, uh, the world is not simple. You know, you ask you know f- about finances or you know taxes or politics and Immediately, you're going to get into like really complex, you know, structures and systems. But you know, theology and the way that you know morality and all of these things work is just as complicated, if not more complicated. Um, which I don't know if that's necessarily comforting, but I think it's comforting to know that people have been struggling with these things. You know, believers, uh, people who fear God, have been struggling with these things for a long time, and that. You know, God's not silent on the matter. You know, he he might not give us everything sketched out. He might not explain everything in, you know, a verse that we can put in our pocket, but he's given us answers and he's given us, you know, the scriptures to study so that we will better understand and get toward those more difficult or or complex answers. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And 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 you know, speaking of C.S. Lewis, I mean, you know, you think about the grief that he experienced once his wife passed away and he even wrote a book about it. And, um, I mean, it's, it's not that suffering as believers shouldn't hurt. That's not it. And, you know, I think it's so helpful that CS Lewis was so honest about his grief and so honest about his struggle, even, even as an older man, you know, this is, this is someone we look up to and, and someone for whom when his wife passed away, I mean, it, it threw him for a loop. And so, you know, there's this, this myth that became pervasive, particularly in evangelical Christianity over the last couple of decades that, that if you have a relationship with God, you should just always be happy and you should never struggle and you should never have any sort of, of uh, difficulty because, you know, Jesus is your Lord and it's all going to be okay. And, and that's all well and good, but we have to remember that Jesus himself wept at the tomb of Lazarus when he was getting ready to go raise him from the dead. But looking into the face of Mary, having looked into the face of Martha, seeing their their utter you know, grief-stricken moment and how broken they were, he wept. And I think that's instructive for us, not only about who our Savior is, but it's instructive for us about living life uh, in a sin fallen world that there are plenty of reasons to weep you know you look at the footage of what happened with helene and the lives that have been lost and the people who are struggling even still because of the impact of hurricane helene you look at you know the potential impact of the hurricane that's slated to hit the west coast of uh, florida here soon um and, and what devastation it might bring i mean these are hard realities and so it is altogether right and appropriate to grieve and to struggle and to and to go to God in prayer. And, and if you look in the Psalms and we're going to cover, you know, worship as lament at some point in this series. But if you look at the Psalms, I mean, lament is a key part of worship because life in a sin fallen world does not always go the way that we want it to go. You know, uh, in the language of business, everything is not always up and to the right in life, uh, talking about a graph and, and the trajectory of, a, of life. And so um, there are definitely things to grieve. And I think it's altogether right and appropriate to do that. I think the Bible teaches us that. And it's not as if it's just in a couple of passages. I mean, there are all sorts of places in Scripture where you see biblical lament. Um, there's an entire book called Lamentations. And so I think that that's a, a key aspect of life in this sin fallen world. And we take our lament directly to God. And I think that's the way that that he has us 
that he wants for us to interact with him over these things that are disappointing and, and that are struggles for us. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that sermon about lamenting and lamentations. Um, not necessarily the book, of course, just lamenting. That, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, that'll take us into today's practical application question. So, you know, we're, you referenced the hurricanes that are happening, uh, you know, October 7th. Uh, there's just really horrible things that do happen in the world. And so, you know, we need to prepare for what we can prepare for. Um, and, you know, we've talked about this in several different ways on the podcast. But, you know, in what way can we, in some sense, have like an emergency plan for when things do go wrong? Um, what kind of spiritual, uh, I don't know, survival kit can we have to get through times of difficult testing? Yeah, overwhelmingly, read the Bible every day. I'm telling you, it it is, um, in my life personally, that one practice reframes things for me so much. Um, because when you read the Bible every day, you are building for yourself a foundation from which you can embrace the things that come in the day and you can keep in mind that God is not far off, but he is near. God is not unaware, but he is deeply aware and that God is doing things that you cannot now perceive. Um, and he is working on your behalf. And so overwhelmingly, those spiritual disciplines, starting with reading the Bible every day, praying every day, getting in church, uh, being in worship corporately with others at least once a week, uh, being a part of a small group Bible study, all of those things are so vitally important. And when the bottom falls out of life, what you find is that all of a sudden, all those things are there. That foundation is there. For example, in this in the situation that my mom's in right now, I mean, her Bible study class and members of her Bible study class have just jumped in and they have brought food and they've stayed with her and they've, they've just been so phenomenally good to her. And all that started being cultivated years ago when she joined that Bible study. I mean, you, you get into a faith family and that changes your experience, even of the darkest moments of life. And so I would encourage everybody, get in the word of God every day, spend time in prayer every day, worship God every day, but be a part of a corporate worship service at least once a week and be part of a group, be part of a group, uh, Bible study group. And I would add to that, you know, serving and things of that nature. But those things are so essential. And they're things that if we'll do them when things are fine, then when things are not fine, we will reap the benefits in that time. Yeah. And we want to make these things easy for you. You know, firstbaptistbg.org has a lot of resources. Uh, there's uh, daily readings. We have a daily reading plan through the Bible, so you can read along with the rest of the church. Uh, we have Bible studies that you can join where you can be in person, in community with uh, fellow believers who are studying the same things that you're stud studying. Uh, I'm linking those in the show notes below. Uh, and then if you have any further questions, you can email us at Reynolds at firstbaptistbg.org. If you have any questions that you want us to talk about on this podcast, you can go to the link in the show notes for that or comment on the post below. Uh, listeners, as always, thank you for listening. Um, God bless you. May he be with you in your times of uh, suffering and testing. And uh, we're, all, we're all in this together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Jeff, can you pray us out for today? Yeah, let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you so much that you are with us always, that you do not leave us and you do not forsake us. And we thank you for the fact that even in difficult moments of life, you are still there and you are still moving and you are doing things that, that we can't even know at the time. But Lord, you're still doing them. And we thank you for your peace that passes understanding. And we pray that in these moments, you would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Father, we continue to pray on this solemn day uh, for the peace of Jerusalem. And we pray that those whose hearts are hardened against Israel, who are doing things to seek, steal and kill and destroy, uh, that they would be stopped. And we pray, Lord, uh, that you would intervene to bring peace to Israel and protection. And Father, for all of us, as we navigate our lives, we pray for those who are 
reeling from the impact of Hurricane Helene. We prayed that that the death toll would stop rising and that that people would begin the recovery effort and and that that they would they would get back to life as normal uh, as much as possible. We we pray that the hurricane that's forming in the Gulf of Mexico the, that it would that it would not be uh, detrimental in any regard to any human life. And um, Lord, we just recognize that the creation groans in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. And we pray, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, until that day when you come and, and you make everything right. Help us to welcome all people unto a relationship with you by sharing the gospel, by living out our faith, and by, by welcoming people to come to Jesus. And Lord, we'll keep our eyes fixed on you, and we'll run with perseverance the race that you have marked out for us. We ask these things trusting you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our channel and submit a question to the link in our show notes. For even more First Baptist content, visit firstbaptistbg.org. Our engineer is Elliot Beckley, and our editors are Chadwick Walden and Tejon Bumpus.